Hey, Tom Bartels here from GrowFoodWell.com, where I teach people how to grow nutrient-dense food in small spaces with less work. This workshop is called Let Food Be Thy Medicine. And the reason I named it that is because a baseline of a nutrient-dense organic diet is the best thing you can do for your overall health, especially if you're growing some of that food at home, which many of you are. The challenge is that during the harvest, at the end of the season, uh, you end up with all this food and you've got to do something with it. Uh, you can't eat it all fresh at that point in time. So today what I'm going to do is show you a lot of tips and methods that I use. I'm going to tap into the archives and show you different ways to process and preserve that nutrient-dense food so that you can use it throughout the winter. I'll be going over tips for garlic, carrots, deep greens like kale and collards, potatoes, tomatoes, squash, pesto, some herbs, corn, leeks, and onions. Now, I'll be going through this information relatively quickly because I don't want to waste any of your time. I try to be as efficient as possible. That's just how I roll. So strap in. Here we go. First off, I'm going to show you how to process and store and preserve garlic. Now, a lot of people grow garlic. It's wonderfully healthy for you. Um, and at the end of the year, you end up with a bunch of garlic. So a lot of people will braid it or store it just as it is because it takes so much labor to peel all the cloves separately. I've done that a bunch and I find that most of the time by midwinter, a lot of that garlic has already desiccated. It's dried out and you crush the clove and it's just empty because it's all dried out. So I tend to not use that anymore because it wastes so much of the value of the garlic. But what I'm about to show you can allow you to sidestep most of that labor. So I have about 20 cloves of hard neck garlic here and uh, they have the skins on them. And I'm going to show you very quickly how to clean 20 cloves of garlic at a time in eight seconds. Okay? Seriously. I'm going to clean 20 cloves in eight seconds. And all you need is a couple of aluminum bowls like that. You need two of them the same size. I'm going to dump a little water out of that one. You simply put the, uh, the garlic cloves with the skin on them in the first bowl. Flip the other one on top of it, and I'm going to make some noise here, so I'll turn the volume down. But count out eight seconds with me. Okay, it's about eight seconds. And you'll see, as I pull these out, that those garlic are now completely peeled. So I have 20 cloves of garlic clean, peeled, ready to go. And that was eight seconds. So keep that in mind. If you have a bunch of garlic to process, now those are all clean. So that's how you clean the garlic quickly and painlessly. No more sticky mess. And now I just take this garlic to process it for the winter. I just put it in the uh, food processor. Now I like to really quickly mince those up. Doesn't take long. Then I'm going to add avocado oil and I put about the same uh, amount of volume of avocado oil as I do garlic. So it's about half and half, maybe a little less of the, uh, the oil, not quite half and half. And the reason I'm using avocado oil is it holds up under high temperatures. So for sautés and cooking, it won't break down like olive oil does. Olive oil is great for bread and fresh eating, but it tends to break down in high heat cooking. So I'm simply going to get enough oil to cover the garlic in the containers, as you'll see in a moment. Now I'll just put that a little bit more, mix the sides in very quickly. And it's, that's done. So now I have a bunch of minced garlic. And I'm going to use these half pint canning jars that work really well for garlic. I simply will take that off and depending on how much garlic you have, you may have several of these, but I'm just going to go ahead and fill that container that's now going to have minced garlic mixed with avocado oil ready to go. And all you have to do is fill as many of these containers as you have garlic, put that cap on, put these in the freezer. So you just pop those in, make sure you label it, uh, the year, the date it was harvested, etc., and processed. And I take one out at a time. I put it in the refrigerator. Uh, we tend to go through it inside a month because we like garlic. 
Um, but then these can keep in the freezer indefinitely. And as you need them, you just pull out one at a time, put it in the fridge, and you can have garlic for six months or a year sitting in your freezer. What's nice about it when it's in the refrigerator is you just pull it out, get a spoon, take as much garlic as you need for whatever recipe or stir fry, pop it right in the pan. It's already got oil in it and it doesn't require you to be peeling garlic each time you cook with garlic. So it's super efficient, very convenient, and you can have a lot of that in your freezer very quickly. So that's the best and fastest way I know to clean and process garlic for the winter. Winter carrots. Now this tip is for those of you who are growing carrots for storage and live in a cold winter climate. The best way to store carrots through the winter is right where they grow. That's right. You simply remove the tops in the fall right before the freeze. Then you cover the entire bed in about one to two feet of good leaf mulch. You can use some remake cloth inside the mulch if you're in a really cold climate, but for most places, a good dense layer of mulch will do the trick. The soil under the mulch stays just above freezing, especially if there's deep snow on top of the mulch. You simply go out during the winter, cut off the snow one section at a time. You remove that mulch and dig up fresh carrots. I put 10 pounds or so into the fridge each time I go out to harvest during the winter. The thing about storing carrots this way is they actually stay alive all winter under that mulch and they get sweeter. They're converting their starches to sugars as the winter progresses. It protects their cells from freezing. So during the winter months, you'll have the sweetest carrots you've ever tasted. And they don't take up any extra storage room in the house or cellar. Processing green beans at the end of the season is relatively easy no matter what kind of green bean you have. I've grown several different kinds and I process them mostly the same way. So I just picked this bed of bush beans. I had providers here, easy pick in the middle, and burgundy over there. These are all uh, in equal spacing. So on the 125 square foot bed, each of this had 33% of the bed space. So they had one third of the entire bed to themselves. And this is what the provider made, what the easy pick made, and what the royal burgundy made. So obviously the uh, provider is a definite provider. Clean them up a little bit in the sense just pull the leaves out and get a nice clean pile. You don't have to wash them yet because we're going to be boiling them. And you want to just line them up. It's a little bit tedious to clean these in, in the sense of cutting the tips off. But if you line them up uh, like that so that they're close to the end on one side, and then just take your knife and use that to get a, a straight edge on it, line them up, take those off, uh, take the tips off on both sides, and then you've got a nice clean uh, pile that you will then cut into bite-sized pieces. So then we're just going to cut them like so. Once you have all the beans chopped up, you want to get your boiling water ready and a sieve or a strainer for that water bath and drop the beans in there for about three minutes. What you're doing is blanching the beans for roughly three minutes, stirring occasionally. Then immediately once they're blanched, you want to drop them into a cold water bath to shut down the cooking process. And this is pretty important. You don't want the beans to get mushy, so you want to stop that cooking by just completely submersing them in cold water to um, cool them down. And once they get to room temperature, they're ready for the next step of processing. This may take a couple of minutes. Then simply put them in Ziploc bags. I tend to flatten them out so that they stack easier in the freezer. Then during the winter, you can pull them out one bag at a time and they're ready to go. Next up, we're going to talk about what to do with deep greens. And deep greens, I consider um, any plant that has basically the high nutritional density. I have seven favorites that I call the Super 7. Kale, collards, beet greens, arugula, bok choy, Swiss chard, and spinach. And you can process them oh, a number of ways, but two of my favorite ways. Uh, first, I'll show you what I do throughout the growing season with green drinks and how I process those. And then secondly, I will show you what to do at the end of the year when you get a lot of that produce in all at once and how to process that and freeze it for later use. You can use it later in stir fries and stuff, but you can also pull it out of the freezer down the road in the winter and also make green drinks once again. So let's jump right into that. So here's an example of a Super 7 bed. 
This four by eight bed has seven different varieties in it of deep greens that are the highest nutrient dense greens you can grow pretty much. You can substitute a couple of different ones for uh, spinach instead of the orac and I can get into details with that uh, in a little bit. But for the most part, uh, this is the highest nutrient dense bed you could grow. And what I do with this throughout the summer is I take off and harvest leaves from each of the seven plants and make green drinks out of it, stir fries and salads. And and this is a really easy way to get high nutrition into your diet without a large space, without growing a ton of different vegetables. I'm growing 40 or 50 different kinds of vegetables on the 16 beds on the property, but as far as a real quick and easy way to get high nutrition out of your garden in one bed, this is the way to do it. So there are the trimmed greens ready to go into the blender. Okay, so I've just got a Cuisinart uh, food processor here. You can use a juicer or a, any kind of uh, puree machine you happen to have, kitchen widget machine. I'm using the standard attachment uh, that blends and uh, processes food. Set the top on there. And one thing I do to start is I'll take uh, about a single apple, depending on how many portions I'm making. This is going to sweeten up this drink quite a bit and it's a natural uh, sugar in the apple. You don't add, you don't want to add any extra sugar, but fruit sugar is about as healthy as it gets as far as sugar is concerned. So we're going to add that apple uh, into the blender first. And I find that if you blend the apple before you put the greens in, it tends to process a little better. So I'm going to make some noise. Okay, so now that the uh, apples are relatively broken up, they're minced for the most part. I'm going to go ahead and take my greens and I can cut them up to make it a little easier so it doesn't just mat in layers in the food processor. Just get them into some two inch squares, just chop them up a little bit and drop them into the side with the apple. Now I'm going to take some water and add that to the mix before I start the uh, food processor up again. I'm adding maybe a cup or two and it depends on how thick or thin you like your green juice. We'll start with about a cup in there just to get it mixing. And I can see it's pretty thick still so I'm going to add another, oh, two cups or so. And then I'm going to let that run a bit. Now you can check on it once in a while. It's got this wonderful smell. It just smells um, incredible, very nutritious. Many people like to add ginger or other flavors or herbs, etc. Uh, you can do that to your own tastes. I tend to just leave it as the base nutrition that I'm looking for from the Super 7 in the, in the garden with a little bit of apple in there just to sweeten it up just a touch. Makes it a little bit more palatable. Otherwise, it's relatively bitter as a drink, but if you get used to it, it's, it's great. Um, but I do like a little bit of apple, so I'm going to thin that out even a little more and add some more water. So the total water that was added to that was roughly four cups and you can take it straight out of the, um, the mixer like that and there's your green drink. It's going to have a little bit of the chunks in there from the vegetables themselves, but super good for you. If you don't like the vegetables, you can always use a strainer and just strain this in and you'll just get the juice like you see here at the bottom that's filtering out. But I like to eat the entire plant. There's so much micronutrient material in there that it's super healthy for you. If you want to break this material down even further, just leave it in the food processor for longer and it'll get smaller and smaller and be like a, a thick smoothie. Right now this is relatively thick, um, but I like it. It's like a liquid salad. So try one. You can put uh, different flavorings in here that you like. Make sure they're all organic and plant-based if you're going for the full nutrition. And um, do try it. The green drinks coming out of the Super 7 Garden, there is so much nutrition in this one glass of green drink that you really can't get it anywhere else. Okay, so at the end of the year, you're going to have more vegetable matter than you can deal with in, in, in green drinks alone. So you're going to have to process it differently. And the easiest way I've found is to go ahead and steam that material. You chop it up, uh, take those greens, chop them up roughly, and add them to a steamer. You don't want to boil them. The steaming holds more of the nutrition in than boiling does. So put them in a steamer attachment on a pot of boiling water for three minutes. 
And after that steaming for three minutes is done, that's basically a blanched green, uh, except you're not boiling it, you're steaming it. You want to put that directly into a cold water bath and that stops the cooking process. So take the residual heat out of that material by just dropping it in some cold water. Uh, feel it, make sure it's nice and cool before you start processing it. Then squeeze all that water out of it. Just take in your hand, squeeze really hard, get most of the water out of there. And then you're going to put those in Ziplocs or seal a meal, whatever you have. And make sure again that it's pressed. The air is out of there mostly and most water is out of there before you completely seal that bag. I like to compress them, keep them flat. They store better in the freezer that way. And then you can just pop them off into the freezer and use them incrementally through the winter for stir fries or any other need you might have for deep greens. Many of the fruit and vegetable varieties that you see in the store and that are pretty common these days have been bred over the years uh, for two things mainly, size and sugar content. And that goes for everything from corn to potatoes to uh, apples and oranges, etc. cetera. Uh, the wild varieties, the original variety um, that existed in nature was a lot smaller, but we keep breeding it for size and sugar content, so consequently that variety doesn't necessarily provide the most nutrition down the road, say 50 or 100 years later when the hybridization process has taken place. So that's why the Peruvian purples are a really interesting nutrient-dense food. You can grow a lot of them in a small space. So potatoes are relatively easy to store. If you have a root cellar, that's of course the best way. You can get by with a cold garage that doesn't freeze or a, a cool basement. Uh, basically, you're looking for a very dark, humid space that doesn't freeze throughout the winter. The benefit there is you can save your potatoes for the following year's seed potatoes. So you can uh, just continue growing crops year after year without buying new seed potatoes. It takes a certain quantity of potatoes to be able to do that. Uh, I'm on my sixth year saving seed potatoes in the root cellar and it just continues every year. If you have enough growing that you can save your seed potatoes for the following planting in the spring, uh, it's really neat. So you'd never have to buy potatoes. One key uh, about storing potatoes is make Make sure that in your root cellar or wherever you store them, uh, you don't let any light leak in, especially in late winter. If it does leak in even a little bit, what it's going to do is stimulate those potatoes to put roots out. And you don't want that uh, because that lessens their lifetime in the, the storage. So you want to make sure they're really dark, relatively high humidity and cold, but not freezing. Tomatoes. What can I say about tomatoes? There's so many ways to process them. But for those of you who have had a lot of tomatoes come in all at once at the end of the season and you don't have a lot of time on your hands, the absolute easiest way I've found to process and store them if you have freezer space is to simply wash them, chop them up in the food processor and store them in half gallon Ziplocs in the freezer. Just straight blended tomatoes. Then later in the winter, you can just thaw out a bag at a time to make salsa, tomato sauce, pasta, or any other recipe that uses tomatoes. It's fast and easy. I just love walking around the gardens and looking at behind other plants and you see this uh, multiple layers of growth and things that are still coming out. But we're coming up on some multiple hard freezes this week, so I had to kind of get everything out of the garden, including a lot of green tomatoes, as you see here behind me. Um, and I wanted to give you a couple tips on how to process green tomatoes at the end of the year if you're trying to beat a freeze like we do quite often on short seasons here in Colorado. Now, in the workshop, I mentioned the details on how to hang entire tomato plants. Uh, you pull them up by the roots and you hang them upside down so that you can actually have these tomatoes ripen on the vine in a garage or a heated space in your basement, for instance. Um, that's one way. It gets a little messy. You need some extra room. If you don't have that much room, uh, here's another way to do it. I've got a large tarp here and you want to do this in a kind of heated space or an insulated garage. Your optimal temperatures uh, are going to be around 60 degrees to get these tomatoes to ripen. If it's too cold, it's going to slow that down considerably. So I'm roughly around that in this garage right now and I'm going to put a big tarp out, lay them in a single layer, including the pink ones that are all, you know, starting to ripen and maybe a couple that are starting to get almost ripe. Um, so we've got a mixture of green and pink tomatoes in here. And what I'm going to be doing is 
The tomatoes, as they ripen, uh, which is much akin to apples and lots of other vegetables, they release a hormone called ethylene. And that kind of promotes the ripening of the fruit. So these darker ones are going to have more ethylene gas kind of emitting from that naturally. And what I'm doing here is trapping that ethylene inside this tarp. And I'm going to kind of close it and fold the edges in so it kind of keeps that airspace shared between all the tomatoes. That ethylene is then going to help accelerate the ripening of the ones that are really green. That's the same concept you may have heard before when someone puts an apple uh, inside a bag with some other ripening fruit to accelerate that because apples actually release more ethylene than just about any other fruit or vegetable. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, drop this tarp just to show you how this works real quick. And then I fold these edges under so that it encloses it like an envelope. And then I cover it with blankets just to uh, give it that extra insulative layer so that I don't get caught with a hard freeze when I'm not expecting it because you want to keep these protected from freezing. So that's a quick and easy way to keep these tomatoes uh, from being damaged by the frost and still getting to a nice ripe red tomato. It takes a few weeks sometimes, but it's well worth the wait, and this is an easy way to do it. Winter squash is one of my favorite things to grow mainly because it offers so much nutrition for so little work. And storing it over the winter months is easy. You simply need a pantry or basement space that's cool, dark, and dry. Most winter squash will last up to five months in that environment. And you simply take one out of storage whenever you need to cook or bake up some great squash dish. So you want to make sure that the, uh, the stem is a clean cut and that dries out. It'll seal itself eventually. You don't want to cut it too close to the top of the, uh, the squash itself. Many varieties of winter squash need to cure for a month or so after harvest. So don't rush things if you want to taste the full flavor. I grow blue hubbards, Oregon sweet meat, pink banana, gete okosamin, and kabocha squash, rotating different varieties from year to year. So next up, we're going to talk about basil. And uh, throughout the season, fresh basil is wonderful to make into pesto and add to other meals. I'm uh, really hooked on pesto because uh, of what it does for the flavor of other foods. So I pretty much exclusively use my basil for pesto. But toward the end of the season, I tend to have too much basil all at once to use fresh. So consequently, to store it for the winter, I end up freezing a fair amount of it. And today I'm going to go over a brief, super easy recipe uh, that you can make with your basil at the end of the season to preserve it and use it later on in the winter. So start with your basil, uh, your fresh basil, is the clip sometimes I'll have a big pile of it here. Uh, I've got some walnuts, garlic and olive oil, Parmesan and salt. And that is basically all you need. You don't have to have the Parmesan, but I really like it. So first off is I take, based on how much basil I have, which is this small pile here, I'm going to take a handful of walnuts, put it in the food processor. Again, it's the easiest thing to make in a food processor. So I've got three small handfuls. I'm going to go ahead and chop that really quick. Pretty good. Then I'm going to, now if I had garlic in clove form, I'd throw a, uh, a clove of garlic in there or two right now and have that mince really quick before I put the leaves in. Um, but since I've got my minced garlic that I made just a minute ago, I'm going to use some of that, throw that in there. And I like a lot of garlic in my pesto. Then we're going to throw in all the uh, basil leaves. Let that process. And you want to make sure that the bigger leaves don't end up on top. That's probably pretty good. It doesn't take long. And then you're going to add, oh, I'd say two cups of olive oil. It takes a fair amount of olive oil to make pesto, but that's what preserves the basil is all that oil. So you can keep the pesto in a canning jar in your fridge for a long period of time, uh, even longer if you keep it in the freezer. Add a little bit more oil. It was about oh, a cup and a half total. And you'll see when it starts getting separated in the oil. Then I'm going to add a little salt. I'd say, I don't know, 
eighth of a teaspoon or less to taste. By the way, you don't want to get too much salt in this. I've made that mistake before. When you dump a bunch of salt, it's hard to get rid of the salty flavor. So be easy on the salt at first. You can always add more later. Looking pretty good. Then the last thing I do once it's all minced is I put the Parmesan in there. And there you have it. There's your pesto. Um, it's all minced up and ready to go. Then you simply store that in a canning jar for later. Now one of a couple things you can do, if this is the end of the year and you're processing a lot of pesto, you can just uh, cap those, crank them down. Then I'm going to label that pesto with the date on it. So that's the best way I know how to store pesto and make it really quick. It's a great way to keep that flavor of basil going throughout the winter. So try that at home. Make a quick batch of pesto to keep in your fridge. Or if you have a lot of basil coming on, go ahead and freeze that pesto for later. Super easy. Just pull it out, thaw it out later on, and you've got pesto throughout the winter. Next up, I want to give you a couple of brief tips on storing rosemary and dill. Again, I'm going to briefly talk about dill. And rosemary, here's a full cutting of dill that I just pulled out of the garden. And usually I'll harvest this uh, from the garden a branch at a time. And the reason being, I like to harvest the dill seed later on that's up on the seed head. Um, so I'll typically just go out and pull just the branches off that have the dill um, herb on the branches themselves strip those off and the plant will continue making a seed head. Leave a few of those branches on for photosynthesis and uh, once you get the seed heads in full maturity you can harvest the dill seed that then becomes another great thing to have for baking and cooking. Dill seed is a wonderful flavor. So now you take this fresh dill and I just typically will spread it out on a plate like so. And sometimes I'll have whole sheet pans full of this. It's super easy. Just put it in a sunny windowsill, let it dry out. And then when you do, you'll come back and it'll be so dry. You can just crumble it up and it will get into a, um, a condition more like you're used to seeing dill. So this is typically what happens to it. So then you can have a jar of dried dill weed that's in your cabinet or your pantry. And you should never really have to buy dill weed again, uh, simply because it self seeds pretty well in the garden. You'll always have a few dill plants coming out. So if you just save a little bit of that every year, you'll have dill for years to come. And now briefly, I'm going to talk about rosemary. It's a wonderful culinary herb and it grows like gangbusters here in, in Colorado. We have two big bushes of rosemary. And the easiest way by far to um, get the leaves off the stem is you grab it at the top right here and you simply pull backwards away from the growth angle of the leaves. Grab the top of the branch, close your, your hands into a small circle and simply strip it down the branch and you'll end up with the leaves. And then you'll take those leaves and much like the dill, put them in a sunny windowsill to dry and in a few days, They'll be brittle and, and crunchy. And at that point, you can simply put them in a canning jar and you'll have rosemary uh, for the whole winter. So this is a wonderful way to store rosemary. It's great for cooking potatoes, uh, breakfast egg dishes, casseroles, omelets, frittatas, stuff like that. It's really an amazing herb and very healthy and obviously really easy to process for the winter. So keep that in mind. If you're growing any herbs in the garden, go out in the fall, harvest that fresh batch, and you can dry them and store them in your pantry for further use in the wintertime. So today I'm going to be pulling out some of these leeks. And uh, in this small bed, this is less than 100 square feet. I've got a, over 100 leeks, somewhere like 102 leeks. Um, I already took out about 40 or 50 onions out of this front row and some of those are still in storage in the freezer. Um, and we're going to pull these leeks out in three different ways. Um, 
Leeks can be left out in the winter if they're deeply mulched. So if you want to do that, that's one way to do it. You don't have to store them anywhere. You put either some straw mulch or I'm going to use some Excelsior, uh, something to protect that bottom uh, 8 to 10 inches of the, the vegetative mass from freezing and then it protects the roots too. And so that way you can get below the snow, move that mulch away and just pull up the leeks whenever you need them during the winter. So that's a very viable way to keep leeks through the winter. The second way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna pull some of these and put them in a little bit of um, basically mulch or in my case Excelsior, you can put it in peat uh, in, the, in the bottom of a bucket and you'll store that uh, as is. We're going to trim the tops of the leaves a little bit. We're going to put them in the root cellar. So they will also stay alive most of the winter in a root cellar if at the proper temperature and a little bit of moisture. There should be some humidity in the root cellar. Um, and then the third way is I'm going to take out some of these and just process them in the food processor and put them in small uh, plastic containers or bags in the freezer and that way uh, throughout the winter you can just pull out pre-cut pre-chopped onions and leeks uh, all winter and it's a really easy way when you're cooking and you need some onions you don't even need to chop them up they're already pre-chopped you just let them thaw out uh, when and you pull them out as needed so that's a really handy way to go I'm gonna do all three of those and we can compare the benefits of each direction so I'm gonna pull out this row here and when I do so uh, since these are going to be either processed or frozen, uh, I'm going to choose maybe the bigger ones for the uh, root cellar. I'm going to be careful not to hurt the roots. So you can do this with a garden trowel one by one with a small trowel. I like to use a pitchfork. It's just a lot easier when you're doing a lot of them. I want to make sure I get below the roots and I'm going to pry it up very carefully. And if it comes up with a root clod, a big clod like that, I'm going to knock it off. And you'll notice that uh, the root clod and the roots themselves, the main root mass of the strongest roots, will stay intact for the most part if you just tap off the, uh, the uh, soil. You're going to get the micro roots and stuff uh, that are wider spectrum in the soil that are going to break away. But you want to make sure you keep that, that main bulk of the, the strongest roots there. So there's a typical leak. And we're going to leave uh, most of the bottom material on there for the stuff that goes in the root cellar and I'm going to cut that off right about here so that it makes a lot easier storage and so we'll go ahead and trim some of the ones that we're going to put in the root cellar but right now I'm just going to pull out that whole row so now I'm ready for the next step uh, for getting the leaks into storage in the root cellar so here I've got two buckets this one has excelsior you can use coir or um, peat moss, you want to get it soaked and then wring it out so it's like a wrung out sponge. You don't want uh, water sitting in there. You don't want it completely saturated. So once you wring it out and it's just wet, I want to put a little layer of that, maybe a half inch on the bottom, so that if there does get to be too much moisture, uh, this will soak it up on the bottom and it won't leave the roots standing in water, which is what you're trying to avoid. Then you'll take each of the um, leaks and you'll put them root side down obviously and you want to cover those roots with this material whether it be the peat or the coir and then each one's going to go in and what I'm doing here is I'm choosing some of the larger ones for storage in the root cellar so I'll take these other ones uh, put them aside for the freezer okay so that one is ready for the root cellar just like that and we've got that uh, moist material down there protecting the roots. The rest of the leaks are just sitting in the bucket and we're going to put that down in the root cellar and it should last a couple three months like that. You want to check on moisture like I said and if you have a really cool basement or a crawl space or something like that that doesn't freeze but does stay cool and relatively humid you might try it down there and kind of check on it every couple weeks or so. So we're going to pull these leeks in and we're just going to chop them up and freeze them. You can freeze both leeks and onions much the same way. Simply dice them either by hand or in a food processor, place them straight into Ziploc bags and into the freezer. Then later in the winter when you need leeks or onions for a recipe, you can simply pull them out and they're already processed and ready for cooking. Well, that's just about all the time I have today. I hope some of these methods are helpful for you and saved you some time. The methods are universal. Uh, they're applicable to just about any location at any scale. 